recording is on. Welcome to the Extinction Nadi December the 5th Sunday meeting for the Eastern Extinction Nadi. And yeah, not many people and the people, some of them are from the West, but anyway. Um, all right, let's get started. So what's, uh, is there anybody who got some agenda items or stuff that they want to talk about? Questions? I have no questions. I, I was wondering about the agenda. You, you wrote on the agenda that it was going to be, we're going to talk about the sigil and the manifesto. The manifesto would be interesting, I think. Um, I have no questions. Have anybody else questions? No questions come to mind here either. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about the manifesto and how that's going to turn out. Okay, well, I've been working on it. Not as hard as I'd like because... Um... I didn't get much sleep because of the, the weather, all these storms kind of thing. Um, so, but anyway, I'm still uh, writing it, working on it. So, yeah, I'm, uh, so yeah, I, I will present it and then we can all go over it in detail. But I'm just kind of laying out front and center the flippening, and then you know, hopefully we can use it to promote the extinction audio a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the thing that I'd like to go over and, you know, I mean, after even the, the manifesto, just as a, as a project is, um, is, is ways to actually survive, uh, survive the actual flipping and just stuff around it on the peripheral of it. So all the stuff adjacent to the, the flipping is, is pretty interesting. And then also kind of flipping watch stuff. Um, I see there's <coughs> volcanoes in Java. <coughs> I think the one in, in Iceland is going to blow soon. But yeah, I, I keep on seeing more um, seismic activity and volcanic activity, but the USGS insists that they, you know, seismic and um, volcanic activity is not on the increase. It's just the reporting is on the increase and people report it more. But uh, if you look at the figures and the, the, the actual reporting, I mean, I look at it and I say they're, they're increasing. They're definitely increasing. I don't know how they can stick to that story. Um, but yeah, the number and the, the magnitude, I think, is increasing. But anyway, that's the kind of thing I think, um, you know, we should watch. And my assumption is you would always get um, warnings of, of this kind of thing, and especially tectonic activity and the the thing that's um interesting i think is that the the earthquakes are are getting deeper and deeper they're some of the deepest they've recorded they didn't think they were even possible that deep and that's the kind of thing that i think would be alarming but my my assumption <laughs> which i'm banking on uh is that you can anticipate the flipping to a certain extent but you will get lots of signs um of the earth being in stress and stuff. So I think we should look out for those and report all those. The The reason is, <clears throat> my reasoning is that you can't kind of prep for uh, something like that. Um, you know, if you, if you prep and it like takes five, 10 years, 20 years, um, you won't be able to prep that long. So I think you have to, not base your life on prepping for the flipping apart from psychologically but um I, I mean in practical terms you can build up skills and things like that but you can't hoard food and do stuff but yeah just in terms of how you actually survive it and people asked um i think my my thinking is that there's there's a you know and then i think that we should research it and make sure everybody agrees but i think that there are three things to actually survive the, the first is uh, you need to survive the actual day of the, the actual event. 
which is probably all about you know not being close to a volcano and a pyroclastic uh, flow that kind of thing um and then you probably want to make sure you don't get hit by tsunamis there's probably a lot of extreme tides and probably undersea slides and things like that um uh and avalanches things like that so you probably want to think about that in terms of um uh and then yeah and earthquakes you don't want to be in a big city because of the fires the you know if you look at the san francisco fire but anyway it's it's worthwhile going back and looking at all of these things um and seeing what it was like in earthquakes and particularly you know how people survived them and maybe you can go and have a look at like rebecca solna about the san francisco earthquake and you'll see the theme over and over again one of your biggest problems is the state mm. that's a theme that just never goes away is is the in the disaster the state always compounds it because they try and keep control they they have they see the world backwards so you know people trying to get baby food and stuff like that out of a store are looters and they get shot and you know it's all, all fucked up you know it's what happened in new orleans they shot lots of people that were just trying to get water from a store it's like what you're supposed to respect uh, walmart's property rights and leave the water in the store <laughs> and then all people are yeah according to the state yeah <laughs> so it's like that's uh, something that uh, you've got to consider is you want a weak state not a strong state um and um yeah and uh, uh so it's there's lots to read on on that and to to read on just surviving earthquakes and things like that but the fire is the bigger danger in an earthquake so glass and initially and then fire um um and so yeah you probably want to be outside an urban area but i am um, i think you can see from all of this you have to kind of weld it into your lifestyle you can't uh i think well, a big mistake to like live in new york and then think oh well i'll get some warning i can get on a plane and <laughs> get to my <laughs> cho chosen strategy i'll have a go bag ready i don't think it's like that i think you'll be caught out and then the other thing is um you know you can't just go and say oh well, i'm gonna go and live in a shack on a on a on a mountain somewhere um, and you say, well, no, nah, that's not going to work out too. You're going to, you're going to do that for a year and you're going to be so bored and lonely. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to pack that in. So you can't, uh, you can't, you kind of have to just know the, the signs and know how to interpret things that other people just will not be able to interpret. Um, and, uh, will get drastically wrong. Um, but so what I'm suggesting is you kind of drift towards it's it's kind of an art um of of living and i think it's a great thing that you know if the flipping never happened and the theory is wrong you still want to do this so you, psychologically and in terms of um of lifestyle it's it's everything that's missing in in i have no qualms about you know foisting the, the theory on the world and promoting it because if it, if it turned, you know, and people say, well, what if it was wrong and people burnt fossil fuel and had a big party and stuff and said, they're going to do that anyway. So the, the thing that everybody's missing, all the, you know, Greta's and Faulty's and all these people that, you know, Bill McGivern and all these, uh, you know, Michael Mann, all the thing they miss is, the first thing is hope. You want to take hope away from people. Hope is a disaster. It's poison. It's causing all the problem. Hope hope um, keeps people working at the system they're never going to give up so they're never going to give up voluntary but but hope keeps them going and keeps this destructive so there'll be nothing left while people have hope and carry on trying to beat this horse to death this horse being of course our planet there'll be no survivors if these people carry, carry on having hope so you know it's like uh, alcoholics if, if an alcoholic has hope and thinks that everything's going to turn out well that's not they're going to drink themselves to death um, they're going to drink themselves to death <laughs> anyway but the one hope is that that you can have is that everybody loses hope just like an alcoholic is that you know one hope is that alcoholics will um just suddenly wake up and 
you lose hope um, and hit rock bottom. So the way to hit, make people hit rock bottom is to take away all the dreams of tech utopia, of solving climate change, of reforming the system. You need to take all that away. And, and the, the idea of the flipping is, does it instantly because it's not in people's control. They need to, be, to have the control taken away. So hope is a disaster. This idea that humans have control is a disaster. We, we do have control. We can make things worse. <clears throat> the, the conceit is we can make things better. It's it's not like that. It's like uh, you can be a little kid and roll a stone down a cliff and make an avalanche, but it doesn't mean you can correct an avalanche once you've rolled that stone. That's the, the thing. Is It's easy to be destructive, but uh, especially because the climate is exquisitely sensitive. They, they think it's all robust. And the, the general thing is they think the climate is robust and you can kick it around and there are no tipping points. It's, uh, it's predictable. Um, it's stable. So you want to take all that away from people that say that it's incredibly delicate. The climate system is incredibly delicate. We, we just misinterpreting the data. Uh, it's um, and the Earth system is incredibly unstable. It's chaotic. You know, there are massive swings, and ice ages, and disasters, and comets, and earth flips. And so you want to take people's certainty away. It's uh, this this hubris that we have is is partly certainty and uh, unwarranted, completely unwarranted. It's all biased. They're all just looking for excuses they're all actually conservatives all the liberals and the progressive humanists are actually arch conservatives underneath like like paul kingsworth in a way is just you know just wants everything to be nice and stable and wars to end and to have this pax romana that is kind of like a frozen living death so <clears throat> yeah so okay so the if you take all those options away from people sweep them off the table <clears throat> they're probably in the best position psychologically uh, the position they should have been in all along is basically a much more humble thing. And then focus on, on on survival. If you start focusing on survival and prepping for something event like the flipping, the uh, you live the lifestyle that no one want, wants to live anyway. You graduate naturally towards it because it's a, you you won't really burn fossil fuels for very long. You can do it. You can have a party. And I, I recommend you do it. Go on a rumspringer. And because we've had all this um, austerity narrative that's completely counterproductive too. It's this nagging, nagging, nagging austerity narrative. And if you think again in terms of an alcoholic, it, it, the alcoholic is drinking because he has a nagging wife saying, oh, you, know, you should stop drinking. You should, say, you, know, you should reform. Pull your socks up. <laughs> it's like the first thing he wants is a fucking drink after all that. And that's kind of what the... The climate movement is doing all these activists they kind of like naggy wives saying yeah, 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 carbon footprint yeah, 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 transition yeah, 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 yeah. oh flights shaming oh virtue signal and it's like god almighty you know if you don't if that doesn't drive you to drink what will but so so we need some relief just just go on a rumspringer go fly and do live like a millionaire and it's like it's not it, it'll be better in the end, because you know you want to accelerate the the Greenland ice sheet melts, and you want to do everything you can to accelerate it. Because once you've admitted that there's never going to be a voluntary deindustrialization, which is what it takes, is um, you know every moment that this machine carries on, it's being destructive and reducing the chances that anybody survives. So the planet is massively degraded in terms of its fauna and flora and the ecosystems are in tatters. And, you know, you take away the industrial system, uh, there's not much for 8 billion people to survive on. And so, you know, the, there's the, if you go back in history <clears throat> and the younger Dryas, which is probably the last flipping, very few people made it through. There's a massive population bottleneck. We all essentially we're all essentially genetically so similar that the only way you can do that is from a tiny founding population. Now, that's incredible considering that the people all over the world at the time of the younger drives. So there were people in 
North America, South America was peopled, Australia, everything, every continent except Antarctica was peopled. And we only made it through with a handful of people. And the, there was plenty to live on, on the ecosystems, the megafauna went extinct. Um, lots and lots of uh, animals went extinct, but there was enough to survive, only just. And now we've got to go through the same thing with uh, the seas are, are massively degraded. There's, I mean, we're talking 99, um, uh, well, okay, I mean, there's, there's a thing called the Sheldon spectrum. Um, and the Sheldon spectrum is, it's a, a phenomenon they observed, it's one of these scaling laws, like uh, I mentioned another one that I said was, in, was evidence against Darwinian um, uh, logic and the idea that evolution just pro progresses randomly. Um, it's like a random walk. It's, it's not a random walk because it uh, pursues these power laws in terms of um, energy and size of, of animals. And that, another one of them, which I didn't mention, was the Sheldon spectrum. Um, and that says, but it's it's also saying that you know if you look at the size of organisms, uh, you, you you know say from ten microns to you know hundred, and then you keep on going up in scales, um, you know of micrometers, so in tens. Uh, the the amount of biomass in that category is constant all the way up to the whale. So they, they noticed this a long time ago um, that it's, um, you know, the this is in marine systems. They have struggled to replicate it in on land. But the marine systems show that, you know, whatever size you take, you'll find that that is, um, you know, the same amount of biomass. So the amount of, at the very top um, orders of magnitude, then you you get all the whales and stuff. If you if you if you count them all up and weigh the, and weigh them, you'd find that they're the same as the the tenth lowest um, thing on the scale, which is all the cyanobacteria and stuff. And so there's a scaling law that defies. Darwin, it's, it's saying that, well, this couldn't happen if it's all <laughs> random. Um, now, the interesting thing is that the um, what's happened recently is the Sheldon spectrum, they found that it's been locked off at the top drastically. So it, since they discovered the Sheldon spectrum, I think in the 50s and 60s, then it was completely intact. Since then, uh, we've, we've wiped out half the stuff at, at the top layers. <laughs> so it's like, this is not going to end well. Um, so this machine, no matter how green you make it, and no, no matter how many people you put on Mars, and no matter how many times you talk about solving climate change, uh, all of these systems uh, have been disrupted. Things like the carbon cycle, um, the pH of the ocean is, is too high and getting higher. And so all of these things uh, um, mean that anybody that survives the next flipping is, you know, they they really, really in trouble um, because <clears throat> there's very little to survive on. Uh, you know, if you go out in your, in your yard or something, go out, if you're in New York, go out into Central Park and see if you could, you know, hunt rats or something <laughs> in uh, in Central Park and see how well you do with uh, all the other millions of New Yorkers doing exactly the same thing and you can see what a disaster we're heading for. Um, we're, we're deeply in overshoot and we're in drawdown. So the sooner that the flipping happens, the better. It will stop the agony in a lot of ways and you know, promote the survival of the next thing. Traditionally, what's happened in all these cataclysms in earth cataclysms, right from the Cambrian explosion to, um, you know, the PMT boundary, the PMT um, uh, boundary and the younger dryas and all these people, <clears throat> like the, the survivors, they do very well. There's normally an explosion. They have, they have lot, abundant resources, lo loads of space. Um, it's kind of uneven. So, yeah, you want to push onto that as fast as possible. Um, so, hmm. yeah, so. Um, I don't understand what you're saying about push, push for that. 
what do you mean by that? Because, I mean, for example, you, you mentioned earlier party planes, etc. All that that's boring stuff. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, maybe it's my age, but honestly, you know, jetting around uh, parties, I found that absolutely boring. It's like drinking or whatever. I mean, after a while. So, I mean, you want to enjoy yourself. You don't want to be doing things that you don't like. So, well, I mean, I, I don't understand how you want to push anything from an individual point of view. Is it? I, I, I don't see what you're... Well, I don't get it. well, maybe for the average person, you know, they like that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I can, yeah. They, they Some other people might. I certainly don't, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what kind uh, of person so you are. The, yeah, what, what I'm talking about is <clears throat> underlying a lot of the environmental movement and climate activism is this streak of puritanism. And it's 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 clearly, you know, if if we didn't have a climate crisis, an ecological crisis now, that, say if it was a thousand years ago, you know all the people active today, they would all be Lutherans and they'd be marching in the streets of, about, you know, morality and stuff. <laughs> you, those the people would they would find a cause, even if even if they were in Eden, they would be wandering around saying, Oh, people mustn't you know, listen to the snake, people mustn't eat the apples and stuff. But so there's this idea of puritanism uh, that's kind of life-hating and, and human-hating. And I think it's very artificial and imposed. So a lot of what the, the youth are doing is they're shaming each other, flight shaming and stuff, and, um, you know, trying to, you know, say against fashion and profligate living and stuff of the, of the rich guys. And I think they should just, it would do them good to go and live a rich person's lifestyle and just see what it's like. Because a lot of them are talking from ignorance. They, they, they it's, it's very easy to be mealy mouthed about a, a lifestyle that you've never had access to and you never assume you, assume you never will. So a lot of the, the, you know, rich people and the transhumanists and the, their lifestyle, their extravagant lifestyle is is a kind of an envy of people that have decided that they're never going to make that. So they're going to kind of squash everybody else that that's, that is living that lifestyle. And so it makes for a divide. It makes for this, you know, these um, super rich guys. Um, and the, the, the di you know, this, this cross purposes of dialogue that I think is very unhelpful and would um, and it's also based on a lie because all the crusties that I've seen, all the hippies and people that are really, you know, into natural fiber and wood and preserving the planet and stuff, they're all fucking hypocrites. If you, um, I mean, I've done this frequently, is dangle a bit of money in front of them and you'll feel all their principles. They, they're rapacious. I've never seen a rich people so, so, um, you know, into into money is basically it's the, I've never seen greed like a a, you know, a sweater wearing you know uh, type. Kingsworth uh, Kingsnorth comes to mind is it's like you know you get all that that kind of um, piety and uh, self denial um, and you just say okay well now you've won the lottery and you've got millions. Uh, they don't give it away. <laughs> they, uh, you know, yeah, they're basically hookers for a dollar. If you, when you actually scratch the surface, and so, uh, so it makes for this very complicated psychology in, a, in the dialogue between the two. If you actually, the first thing that amazes, I think, people that have never been in it is, if you hang out with rich people, it is a kind of a dream. It's kind of a drug to be rich. To, to actually be super rich and hang out. There's, there's nobody, you know, I always, um, I always kind of thought that move, you know, in, in Hollywood, the, the, the agreement that Hollywood has with its public and its audience is that, well, we all middle class and we all kind of hate the rich and, you know, we all kind of in with the poor and the guys below decks because they're kind of real and the guys, you know, the super rich we can't relate to and they're kind of cold and horrible. So the villains are all super rich. And then, so you, for example, you get on the Titanic, then you get, you know, the 
fat Kate there or whatever. And she, she's like, oh, she's really rich. And she's, uh, you know, but the rich people all on the first class are all boring and stuff. And she goes down in steerage and they're all the Irish dancing on the tables. And we all, and the audience is all with her going like, yeah, if I was on the Titanic, yeah, I would be down there with the guys in steerage and stuff. And I say like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You're middle class. You've never been seen the guys in steerage, and you've never seen the guys on the on the top deck. And so I say, I'll tell you, is all you little house slaves in the middle class is you would go running for first class. You would absolutely fucking adore it. You would be in heaven. You would be wetting yourself at how how nice it is to be in that environment, and you would shit yourself if you were if you knew what it was like in steerage. So it's like I, I don't the agree first thing. With you. I don't agree with you at all, because oh, I've been, yeah. I've been, no, I've, been wait, in the, wait, I've been in there. I've been when I was young. Wait, I was wait, in the wait, very wait, rich, wait, 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 wait. Like you're in it's another like, room. It takes, it's horrible. It's, it's ways. Wait, wait, wait. I haven't finished. <laughs> it takes a little while till you get to see what it is. So basically, in the first class thing, it takes a while. You have to actually live that dream like a drug. It's like a drug. It eventually wears off, and then you find out those guys are super boring. It's a, you find out it's like a living hell in first class, but you have to live it to actually see it. Most people, you you won't just first introduced to it, you won't see it. It's only if you hang out there that you start to see it. Then you you start to see a different side of the guys in steerage. But if you middle class and you're taken into either one of them, it'll take you a while to get it. It'll take you a while to get what, what's going on, that, that people are nice in steerage and, uh, and people are, are kind of genteel in first class. But you, the, I'm telling you that anybody would be easily bought. The, 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 most of the middle class people I know that don't know those worlds that they condemn, uh, they would be suckered in by them uh, very easily. So you only get them out of your system if you actually go into them and actually see them, right? So it's 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 uh, it's silly if you're middle class like John Oliver or something like that, and you condemn the say the royalty and the the Queen and what you know life in the rich and famous in Buckingham Palace is if if you actually went to one of those dinners or something, you you'd be amazed how easily you were gold. And how fantastic you you really thought it was. So it's it's only when you've actually been there for a while and you start to see through it that you start to see the 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 side that is actually correct. So it's kind of like you've you've got it right, but for the wrong reasons. You're talking out of ignorance about um, about about saying it would be better to talk about it for knowledge. So I'd say go on a Rumspringer. You go and go on first class and an air aircraft and stuff, and just see how fucking nice it is before you condemn it. It takes a little while to actually, and you have to be in it before you you actually can give it up. So it's kind of like uh, being a Puritan and condemning drugs when you've never had them. It's like the very first time you have them, they go, "Oh, I made a big mistake. Ecstasy is wonderful." Well, you've got to have ecstasy for a while and see what drugs are really all about. And then you, you say, oh, shit, this is a nightmare. You say, yes, now you know what it's about. But I'm talking against this false um, presupposition. It's just a well, prejudice. Yeah, but that, 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 that is not realistic because nobody can have, not everyone can have that experience. It's impossible mathematically first. I mean, you can't get every individual to live, uh, to take drugs and to experience them and then understand what they are and stop or you can't get everybody to go and live the the, the jet society type of life and so it's not it, this is not realistic i mean you know a few of us might have done that okay fine it's good but i think we can benefit from the experience of people around us and i don't know even though i did the same thing i was there for a while and i understood but i always remember my grandmother who told me when i was very young she always told me only trust poor people and I couldn't understand why she was saying that because she was coming from a well, she had a, a poor bringing, but she was in a kind of a wealthy type of place. But she's always was telling us when we were kids, only trust poor people. And I, I it's not, I didn't, I did, I had that at the back of my mind. And even I think we need to 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 use the experience of other people. We can't we can't all go and 
have dinners in Buckingham Palace and, you know, live on, on luxury, you know, yachts and stuff. So I think, you know, uh, I don't, I don't see what, when uh, you were saying. No, okay. So, so yeah, I mean, no, I'm not talking, I'm so I'm just talking to middle class people and middle class people can do it. So I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody on the whole, you know, everybody in India can go and see what it's like being a billionaire, but you should try because the, uh, you know, everybody like that listen to, to this video could. So it's, it's, I'm not saying that you really go and see, you know, sample the lifestyles of the rich and famous, but if you can, you should. I mean, you can just go on a first class plane ticket and that'll open your eyes to a very different world. Um, so that's 10 grand to go across the Atlantic and it's 10 grand is worth spending <laughs> to, to actually see what you're talking about and you'll be amazed at what a hypocrite you are. So I think it's worth, worth understanding all these, all these rich people before you, you condemn them. There's the one well, thing. I totally, the I totally agree. And I totally agree on, on your view on Puritanism. It's, it's nauseating. And I, I understand totally that it was just a, you were trying. You were saying something about pushing uh, earlier about precipitating, oh, yeah. oh. and it's a, it's a, okay, yeah, it's so a just piece one of mind that's difficult to understand in the light of of um, of what of, of what we're talking about. Because is it is it a recommendation? Is it a form of anti prepping? Is it what, what is it exactly yeah. that you mean by that? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So okay. So no. Just one one more thought on the on the um, whether people should act actually go, go and try this out so so if you I'm not, it's not a thing that you have to be mega rich to be able, able to afford is i'm just saying if you can't afford anything else just be like the amish going on a rumspringer what i'm really talking about is go on a rumspringer because you see exactly the same as the amish is you can't really be amish unless you've seen the other side and that's why they go on a rumspringer. That's why I'm saying to people here is don't go diving into austerity and living in a log cabin um, under pressure. Um, don't go Amish um, out of conviction of, of something which you're not knowledgeable about. Is, is first go on a rumspringer and see the other side, and then you're ready to be Amish. But you, what I'm talking against is this current fad where everybody goes Amish because it's, you know, that's a young people's thing. They've, they've, um, it's, it's uh, based on disillusionment that they can ever be anything other than Amish. They, they think they've had their, you know, prosperous future, their boomer future taken away from them. Therefore, they have to be Amish. And there's this kind of hard edge on it. It's, it's, um, do you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's kind of a nasty, um, uh, a nasty Amish, <laughs> where it's all uh, condemning and so, so far. So I say the, the very first thing people need to do after they realize that all their efforts and stuff are in vain um, um, is to is to go and uh, go on a rumspringer. Just go and see what you've been denying yourself because you thought that there was hope. And then that's the first stage you get to before you realize, okay, I got it now. I understand how wonderful it is being rich and I understand how narrow it is and how how awful underneath that rich people are not happy. But you you can you can tell yourself that all you you like because you Disney told you that. But unless you've actually seen it and you've been through it yourself, you're not really ready to be Amish. And so that's why I'm saying is go on a rumspring, go and find out what the what, yeah. what it's like. Yeah, it um, probably it probably helps, you know, untangle people's minds, like untangles the resentment and envy that fuels all this. And if you untangle that, then it helps you, you know, get along better in your journey to figuring the stuff out. I think yeah. after that, also, you don't, it's not only the resentment or the the envy that you, you could go, you could get rid of, but suddenly you, you, you get a sort of pity, uh, a kind of, exactly. you feel sorry. You feel sorry for the people stuck in there, the people stuck in, in wealth, stuck in that life, and you look at their life, and suddenly you just, you can't hate them anymore. You can't, you can't even envy them. You really feel sorry for them. Exactly. But you see, the the thing is, all of this, 
all of this is about giving up. The whole point of uh, the flippening, the psychology of the flippening is, is to make people give up. It's, it's um, the, whole, the whole key um, to survival in this uh, ordeal is just like an alcoholic, is to make them give up. Um, and so you can't give up something you've never had. And what all these these liberals and stuff are doing is in the middle class, they they doing this faux renunciation of something they've never had. So I'm saying you have to you have to be rich as much as you can, or at least be profligate or be you know a hedonist um, before you can give it up. You can't say, "Oh, I gave up hedonism." And say, "Really." What did you do as a hedonist? <laughs> Nothing. You ate carrots and tofu and, you know, condemned fast fashion and spat on rich people and say, no, you're a hypocrite. You've never been rich. So, you know, you can't, you can't. It's like, uh, it's like a non, it's like a non who never, a non who gives up on sex and never had sex. I always found, you know, it's the same sort of dynamic that your basic things, you really have to, to explore them, you know. Exactly. It's it's the hypocrisy of all piety where people condemn sinners and stuff and, so, you know, spout the evils of sin and stuff and say, well, how much sin have you actually done? None at all. It's like they're all Mike Pence's. So, so you're saying like, so you're not really condemning sin and, and saying that everybody should give it up. You're really against it and you've never had that. That's an entirely different thing. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about is... Um, so, okay, but um, then talking about actually pushing it um, is, I, you know, the, the idea of uh, pushing it means you know, just burn fossil fuel. Go and, you, you see, the part of the thing about burning fossil fuel, is that, well, this is what I see anyway, is that I see all these, these rich guys in their big power boats and super yachts and helicopters and stuff, and they all come out here um, to to burn fossil fuel and live the high life. Um, the part of what they're doing there, you can see in the, they just complete arrogant assholes, just, you know, plowing up the place with their wake and just, just, um, they, they just being indulgent and, and selfish and <clears throat> what they on, you can see it again and again, you can see it in the expressions and stuff like that. It's, they're on a power trip. They they are literally saying indulging in themselves. They're like, you know, look at me. I'm I'm king. I've got uh, all the the serotonin is oozing through my blood vessels. Um, they feeling uh, really on top of the world in this kind of uh, self indulgent way. And so um, the. You know that's part of fossil fuel is an amplifier for saying that or for your ego. So all of these things are amplification of the ego and uh, narcissism. They need people to see them they, to the point where it, if you ignore people, they they get vicious, they get angry. I mean, I've I've done this a number of times. I, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you just one little story that uh, once in my not so rich phase, but when I was getting money from rich people, um, a rich person took me, to, had private seats in a ball game, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, basketball. Um, so, uh, um, I, and so, uh, yeah, so it, during this thing, we went, we had access down to the tunnel where you can go down in the tunnel to get drinks in this private bar, which is <laughs> all the, the hoi polloi. Um, and uh, while we we're just uh, coming back with our drinks through the, the tunnel, where all the players come through, then the, suddenly all these security guards come running up. And they're all running and they say, you know, stand back and stuff. <laughs> all black guys in suits, you know, talking into their thing. And they were like, oh, what? who's coming here? And there's like, and it turned out to be Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> and so... Basically, I was disgusted, and I thought, "Oh, fuck this, man!" And I thought, "Like, I'm not a second-class citizen. You're just a private individual. You're nothing." So I just like told the security guys to kind of fuck off, 
and just carried on walking and wouldn't stand by and, you know, stand at the side to let the fucker through. Um, and so I just turned, you know, carried on walking. And so he must have seen me because uh, he went and uh, he went and sat right behind the hoop. Um, and I was just across the right behind where the players uh, huddle was. Um, and I swear to God, he spent the rest of the fucking game just glaring at me. He, I, because he had people coming up asking for autographs and stuff, and I was just like, fuck me. <laughs> it was written all over my face. And here's me. I'm no absolute nobody. And here's this, like, famous dude. And the famous dude, you could see, I ruined the entire game for him because I wouldn't kowtow. I, he, it drove him nuts. You could see he was furious. I wouldn't be surprised if he fucking took a hit out of me. He was so furious that there was one little bastard that wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, give him uh, his due, or well, as he saw it. And so, like that's that's kind of where all these guys are at. They and fossil fuel is the way they do it. Is they, they'll use fossil fuel to just say enlarge themselves and magnify themselves. And that's that's what they're doing. It's a it's a power magnifier. It's, it's the energy of our of our system. And so they they're using it for for that. Now I'm convinced that if in terms of psychology, if they knew there was no future, everything they were doing in vain and stuff, and Everybody had the right uh, with that, you know, part of what they're doing is the flouting convention. The more you say, don't burn fossil fuels, the more they say, fuck you. It's like Lewis Farrakhan saying, fuck you. You know, I, you may not be able allowed to burn fossil fuel, but I can. It's, it's basically um, conspicuous consumption is part of this. Now, all that goes away if everybody knows we're in the fucking end times. It's like, you know, if it becomes... Do that if you want, but it's like it's the end times. Anybody can, it's free for all. It suddenly deflates all that behavior. I, I, I notice a lot of those guys have a, have a dog of depression that, that haunts them. And they, they would stay at home miserable or drug, drug induced with, you know, kind of um, Oxycontin and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of them are on drugs to just get through the day. And so, so I'm convinced in my own mind that if you really want to rich fucks to stop burning fossil fuels is give them ultimate permission, just democratize it, say, go for it. We're all fucked. Go for it. And that would really take the sting out of what they're doing. I don't think a lot of people in the climate movement and stuff realize the psychology of what's going on. They kind of assume, well, we're all good guys. We're all in this together. We all have this liberal viewpoint where we all for the system and we're all basically conservatives and we all want to prop up the system and make sure there's a democracy. No, <laughs> the top and the bottom don't. The, the very top guys couldn't give a fuck about your little life and what you want about the system. They're all about themselves and, and they, they're sticking it to you. And I don't think that they, the average climate activist realizes when they have a banner up, they don't realize that that banner is actually causing those rich fucks to burn more fossil fuels. I mean, they'll say in public, oh, yeah, I have offsets against uh, my jet and stuff like Bill Gates does. But but over a, over a glass of champagne, he's fucking laughing at you. I've seen it. <laughs> They're laughing at, at the sensibilities of activists and and greens and stuff like that. They're just using you. Yeah. So, so, uh, so permitting the use of fossil fuel is promoting. But, but now in terms of just stopping the machine, once you realize that this machine is never gonna stop voluntarily, it's just never, it's, it's not based on consumption or anything, it's based on power. And people will give up their, their life before they'll give up their power. So. So the only way to bring this uh, machine to, to a halt is by, you know, like an alcoholic, is to get it to drink itself to death. You cannot you, keep the you, oil in the you, ground. Do you think psychologically uh, such a type of narcissist can become a doomer? They are doomers. Part of, yeah. part of the narcissism of the rich is the cynical doomerism. You can see it in people like Elon Musk and stuff. They, 
they promote themselves as optimists because they're playing to the crowd. But if you, if you, you know, you catch them on off moments, they actually do miss. You see, they they're very cynical about the the shape the shape of the world. I mean, the stuff that Bill Gates is doing that everybody applauds him for being so such an optimist and he keeps on saying in this hollow kind of dry eyed way you know this kind of dead eyed way kind of like zuck in his dead eyes they they all kind of numb those those people and when they say they're optimists they're lying you can hear you can see it on their face i mean if 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 bill gates was an optimist why would he be investing in the stuff that he's investing in in the bill and melinda gates foundation it's all dark it's all dark stuff, the, the machines, the vaccines, the depopulation stuff, all of these things that are stated aims that look like, well, I'm solving the world's problems, as, as you can see, just just his interests and obsessions, which he's had for decades, right? They go back, uh, he, he wrote this book called The Road Ahead, uh, which I read in the 90s. And in it, he laid out basically the fourth industrial revolution. When I read it, I didn't realize what he was saying was, I'm going to make this future. He, he wrote it as this is just going to happen. This is like Alvin Toffler, like a futurist. Is This is probably what's going to happen. He, he wasn't saying that. He was going to be saying, this is my life. My life's work is to make this fucking hell work. And so you can see from that that underneath it all, the ultimate cynics and pessimists. So they because they're anti-life and, and life is messy and, and horrible and so they they hate us they hate life they hate they hate the hoi polloi they hate the unpredictability it's it's everything's a threat to them and you see to for the only respite these super rich guys get is hanging out with each other and then they compete with each other but if they hang out with with uh, the hoi polloi all the hoi polloi wants is money they just want money. So you have to imagine living in Bill Gates' as world. Well. Every fact, every miserable fact you meet is after they've asked you for your autograph and stuff. They, they kind of like, you know, you've got, you know, billions and billions. You've got $40 billion. You could write me a check for a million dollars now and you wouldn't even know this. Why not you do it? Is <laughs> the kind of sentiment about every poor person they ever meet. Is that everybody just wants a hand up. And so, so... And they uh, they they completely undeserving because they you know in the eyes of the rich person. So Bill Gates, if you want to see what he thinks of you, is is he he thinks that the system works for rich people, right? It's you you pass a kind of barrier very very soon. You only need a few million in the bank. Uh, it's surprising how quickly the world turns. But from there, you suddenly get a following wind. So so for the ninety nine percent. There's a headwind, always this headwind, and it's really based on debt. If you get over a few million, very few, um, you'll suddenly find that everything's a tailwind. So, you know, you go from like not being able to afford a decent meal to being able to, to you know, not, not being able to pay for a meal. You know, people, you know, if you get to that, that status, those guys don't pay for anything. Everything's free because they want the... They, they want the people's patronage. Eventually, it becomes as how, you know, what uh, what restaurants will give you, um, you know, free meals. It becomes the next competition. <laughs> it's like, uh, but anywhere that knows you, you, as a celebrity, you won't be able to pay for a meal. Uh, and so it's it's kind of a triumph. I saw John Cleese once in this place in Santa Barbara, and he, he uh, paid for the meal on a credit card. But it's because the, it was a Thai restaurant. The guys didn't didn't know who John Cleese was, and you could see that's why he was there. He was there for the, the anonymity. But the idea that anybody like of John Cleese's status would pay for a meal in any place. But you see, you can see that he went to this little anonymous place because he couldn't stand being around people that knew him. He went to Santa Barbara because no one knew him. <laughs> And so uh, it's it's so I'm just painting this picture of what it's like for these uh, for these these rich bastards and and so they despise you because you are such a sheep, right? In in their world, once you get the following wind, you think you're a genius because the world tells you you're a genius. I mean, Elon Musk is as thick as pig shit. 
but he thinks he's a genius because everybody says he's a genius. Everybody says oh, he's the most intelligent. What they mean is he's the richest bastard in the room. He's the most successful. But it's all luck, right? It hasn't got anything to do with talent. And so once you, so, but from their point of view, they don't know. They're king of the castle. Everybody's grooming them all the time. And they get infinite narcissistic supply because of our fucked up values. And so they think that you're an idiot because it's so easy to get in their position. They think that the fact that you don't is like, you know, what kind of a despicable person are you? That you're such a damn sheep. You just a, you obey the rules. You do everything by the book. You poor. You live a miserable life, and you can't you can't do anything. Everything every you blocked at every turn, and they the door opens for them. So everything they do, you know, they, Bill Gates doesn't care about vaccine passports. Nobody's going to ask him for his vaccine passport. <laughs> See, they won't. So it's a you know. He doesn't go through, it doesn't matter what happens in 9-11. And he's never met a TSA officer in his life. He's never gone through a scan in his life. He doesn't even carry a fucking baggage. The baggage comes on a separate plane. See, I, I've seen these guys on the super yachts and stuff. Is all their shit often comes the week before they arrive. When they arrive, they arrive in a coat. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the the it's um they they're not struggling at all they the things they're struggling with is uh, existential things and stuff like that and particularly on losing that position um and so i'm just saying that i want to paint a picture of what these people are like and so you know you can you can get to see the the psychology because these are the guys that definitely do want to survive the flipping <laughs> and and I think a lot know, know it's coming. So they kind of like, you know, but as the extinctionality, we should like say, you know, well, we want people to survive, even if it's them. If that's what it takes to survive is that, you know, you need a colony on Mars and Elon Musk and all these half human, transhuman, you know, abominations of human beings. If that's all that survives, I'd say, yeah, well, it's better than nothing. Um, so, so, okay, that was one thing, but okay, so now I still haven't gotten to the pushing it. So pushing it means um, just telling people, burn fossil fuel, man, come on, just go for it, go, go, go hog wild. We need as much CO2 as possible, as fast as we can melt the Greenland ice sheet, because that's the only way we, you know, if you can advance the flipping, which you can, geoengineering is not going to stop the flipping, right? It's too slow. So, so David Keith and those guys, Ken Caldera, it'll take them decades to actually start seriously putting sulfates up there because they have to move very, very slowly and there's a strong opposition from the public. Um, all of these things are, are negatives. Uh, you know, you don't, the oceans are hanging on by a thread. You don't want to increase the pH and any, as I've mentioned before, any sulfates you put up there, say you, you drop the earth's temperature by one degree. Well, you know, that's going to be one degree on top of all the volcanic activity. So you really just don't want that. You might, you might really push things over the edge. But as for geoengineering, yeah, you can do geoengineering to advance the flipping, you can go and put soot on Greenland ice sheet, for example. And so, yeah, I, I think that we should be accelerationists from the point of view as this society needs to drink itself to death. It needs to choke itself to death. So the first thing is to be permissive to rich people to say like, go for it. Just, just be quick. Just, you know, don't hold back. <laughs> uh, you know that everybody in, in India and in China and so they're not going to stop there. So Indians have about a tenth of the standard of living of people in America. They're going to double their population um, before 2050. China has half the standard of living of people in America. They, they're going to try and double that by 2030. So it's, you're not going to stop them. Right? Whatever you do in terms of green tech in the West and carbon taxes and stuff, you, you're just exporting the carbon footprint to them. They'll say, thank you. We're glad you took the pressure off the oil price and reduced demand for oil. 
because now it makes it cheaper for us to burn and that's that's what they're going to do well anyway so, they're making that, all the green tech they're making the green tech that Europe is using, India and China. They're producing wind turbines and solar panels. That's where they're made. Mostly. Yeah, but they're fossil fuel products, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So 60% yeah. of the wind farms, uh, are, you know, the wind turbines are glass, apart from like experimental wooden ones and stuff. So glass, glass fiber is 60% glass. So every ton of glass uh, produces three tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's not going to change. <laughs> so, so when you see the, the epoxy and fiberglass, uh, the epoxy and uh, glass fiber. So, and then apart from that, it's steel. So steel is made, you know, with coke. <laughs> so it's there's a massive carbon footprint in manufacturing that they hope gets made back. Um, over like 30 years, 20 or 30 years. But the same applies to PV. You know, it's a solar panel is a, a massive emission of, um, uh, of carbon in, in the manufacturing and deployment and installation and stuff. And then you hope that it re recoups that over about 10 or 20 years, and then it goes to landfill and it becomes a methane problem. Again. But the, the, you know, the... They can't be recycled or you can't get glass fiber and epoxy or something and recycle it. So, and then, you know, while they serviced uh, or, you know, uh, all the green jobs, they go for, uh, they go into people's pockets and people are not going to spend them in a green way. They're going to spend them into the fossil fuel economy. They're going to be spent on you know, high standards of living, which equals carbon. And they're going to, and that means holidays abroad and flights and uh, bigger cars, even if the cars are electric, it doesn't matter. You know, all the investment is is in the in the manufacturing in terms of carbon. So it's very, all this green stimulus stuff is just a massive belch of carbon. And you say, great, as long as you're melting the melting the Greenland ice cap, and we're getting closer to ending this game. It's it's if this is the only way that this this ends. Because people drink, you know, basically the alcoholic drinks itself to death. Then get on with it. Start plying it with alcohol. And can even probably, well, I don't know if this would work, but getting crop dusters and dumping soot on the ice sheet. <laughs> yeah, you can just make fires. You can you can just burn oil fires like uh, like they were in um, in Iraq when you know like Saddam did. If, if you got all those oil wells that were born, they, they basically just put oil in trenches and lit it. If, if you did that, you know, upwind in Greenland, it's basically you would, you would cover, cover the whole of Greenland in, in soot with a very small amount of effort. Oh, that's an idea. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, in, in yeah, in terms of actually, um, you know, I think you could carve out bits of ice. You could actually lay lay black strips that would essentially be like zip lines for the for the ice to to carve out a trench and, and break off. So I, th I think uh, we should explore all of these and promote them. A just uh, as a publicity stunt to to be to be outrageous but also you know it's all there's also an argument for reverse psychology you see everybody is so keen on preserving this machine and reforming it and doing the impossible that they need to see some people that are active saying like the opposite to actually uh, see the reverse psychology in other words there's a I got a friend who's quite a rich guy. He's, uh, he made his money out of uh, hospitals. Um, and he, he told me he made a big splash in the medical world in the UK because a lot of the things that he did, they were mental hospitals. So uh, he, he got a lot of lawsuits, I think, and stuff because he... He changed, he experimented with people that were suicidal. So there's a protocol that you follow with people that are suicidal. 
he tried reverse psychology once and then there was this girl who said she's suicidal one of his patients and so uh he said uh, yeah go for it he said uh, he said i will i will stand by here and you have a right to to kill yourself if you want and so i'm, I'm not going to intervene and she said you bastard <laughs> she didn't kill herself and he found that that was the best way he suddenly got remarkable results when the results they were getting were miserable um, but he got because he was going against the protocol and the ethics of the profession uh, he got a lot of pushback um, but eventually i think from what he told me he says that is the way they deal with it now they found that if you try and stop people that are trying to you know commit suicide they um you get a worse result than if you just say okay it's it's your right go for it and then you kind of take the steam out of it um and i think there's the there's the same kind of thing as a, as a society we're committing suicide and it kind of takes the steam out of it saying go for it in fact i'll help you <laughs> uh and then that puts a new new light on it uh, in terms of just this this idea of trying to preserve this this inhuman machine this machine of death that's um our industrial society and, and so you know everybody says no we have to be industrial say so, yeah you do you do have to be industrial in fact more so let me help you with that let me let me uh, let me give you more co2 let me give you more you know more fuck up yeah, yeah, it's you know, like drink let, stuff to death. Yeah, let me pour you another one. Yeah, it's like uh, rev up the accelerator, hit the gas. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, so I mean, this this kind of reverse psychology works. It works like a dream. It's like um, uh, maybe works too well. In fact, uh, you you definitely hope we don't make headway and everybody reforms themselves. <laughs> that would be really bad. <laughs> But I don't think so. I don't think we all amount to a power, power of beings. I think everybody's going to ignore the extinction already. But still, as much as we can, I think that's that's the, the way to do it. This this stuff works because I, I think I mentioned once that my my kids, well, the my stepkids, the older ones, um, they they have no credit. None of my kids have any credit, um, and. Uh, you know, I mean, debt is what I mean. They have great credit. They don't have any debt. And the reason was, is uh, because when they were growing up, I said, you know, they got to be teenagers. And I said, well, now we must uh, teach them about debt. So, like, let's get them credit cards and get them, <laughs> get them into debt, get them loaded up with loads of debt so they get, you know, they can find out what the system really is all about. And uh, the kids wouldn't do it. They were like, no, mommy, don't let dad get you know, you know, put us in debt. Please, God, don't. Let. So they won't touch a credit card or anything because, because they, uh, they, they were so scared of me loading them up with debt. Now, oh, man. That to all the other hedonist kids where they just can't wait to get their hands on a credit card and get new stuff and stuff. So that my kids never went there because I, I tried to force them down that route. Yes, I did exactly the same. And my son is now 30, he still doesn't have a credit card. Because I, I, I put the fear of the fear of God in him about this thing of debt. So I, it works very well. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, what, the minute I understood, like I don't even have a credit score or a credit card. <laughs> the minute I understood what the hell that shit means, I'm like, no, I'm not going to borrow from somebody unless I know them and trust them. <laughs> no way. <laughs> But uh, the, the same thing, I, th I think, applies on a vast scale. Instead of saying everybody must reform and be austere and say, you know, it's like, go for it. Burn fossil fuels. The more, the merrier. We need the, you know, instead of saying, oh, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. Oh, we all doomed. We must reform, repent, and say, no, no, no. Think, find ways to make it melt faster so we get all this shit over with. So that's if what anybody's going to reform, that's when they're going to reform. That's going to be shocking. Nobody wants people need shock. You see. So that's what you mean by pushing. It's um, it's kind of reverse psychology and, and saying to the alcoholic, "Well, here's some whiskey. Now go go and you know drink yourself to." I I, I yeah, but don't there is a it's, it's there is a, an addiction. Huh? Yeah. I'll have to think about that one. Uh, 
yeah, yeah it's, it, it's it's a it's a shock tactic right yeah yeah it's because the in, industrial civilization is a poison goblet and the you know the activists are pointing at people saying if you drink that it's bad boo -hoo, but now we should just like push the goblet towards them not like go for it have a chug you know and if they and that that'll fuck them up really bad You're like wait you were just shaming me a minute ago and now you want me to drink this shit <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, it's the ultimate cynicism. It's, it's a recognition of what everybody knows. Everybody knows that there's never going to be a... Everybody knows, A, we need a massive deindustrialization. Everybody knows. They just say, well, that's impossible. So you say, yeah, okay, agree, it's impossible. So now, drink yourself to death. Basically, this. so the next stop... Everybody says, well, we can't stop this death machine. So, and everybody knows we can't reform it. So we can't voluntarily stop it. We know that we can't involuntarily stop it. Like Ted Kaczynski and stuff is right, but the anti-tech revolution is coming too slow. And uh, it's, it's probably not going to work. There's probably not enough numbers. Probably the opposition against it is, is too strong. It could work, but uh, I have doubts that it could be sustainable. So they, you've got to bring the system down, the industrial system down, which is achievable, but keeping it down is a problem. Do you think this and, reverse psychology could apply also to the situation where we're in at the moment with this um, this surveillance and, and uh, about the COVID crisis and all this? Because I'm kind of trying to devise mind games around that too, because you're starting to, you know... I, what what you're saying to now at the moment when when there is a there's a narrative what we all know about you know who is good in society is the one that gets vaccinated and who is getting his jabs and his boosters and everything and i'm i'm kind of thinking about the lines of what you say would that apply there too could we bring down this this authoritarian kind of you know trend that's going on to 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 herd people into being compliant with with the health system uh, with the same techniques you know saying well no yeah. now you know yeah. i don't know it's, yeah, it's i yeah i think so because it's the same as uh as saying uh, you know about the the death camp is like saying you want it to be authoritarian so like saying like well nobody's going to rebel um you know so it's like being in Auschwitz, just being the arch cynic and saying, look, no, none of these inmates are going to rebel. They all support Auschwitz. They, on the, they may say lament the system and lament the fact that they're going to wind up in an oven. But day to day, they all go out and support the system. They're all obedient. They all do their work. They all take their jabs. They all do the stuff that keeps Auschwitz together and they refuse to rebel while they all wring their hands about their fate. And so you say, well, this isn't going to solve itself and the only the next stop on this where this is the trajectory that this is headed in the next stop is everybody winds up in the gas chambers they're not going to be anybody left at this rate if that's the fate and nobody will do anything to stop it well then it's better to get it over with quickly so then then i'm with the ss i'm with the guards i'm saying like let's let's get more people in hurry it up Hurry it up. Let's get this over with. All these people want to die. Let's go for it. Burn them. Quick. Let's do this and get our switch over with. And then, because once they all burnt, there won't be any more atrocities. You won't have any more atrocities. Or if you do any more atrocities, they'll be to your own people. So it's basically saying, let's get to the point where, you know, all this insanity is over. So I'm with the guards. I'm with the, the camp system, just like you are. Uh, let's move this along. It's kind of like Fawlty was saying, you know, like um, uh, the reverse psychology of, of Extinction Rebellion saying, you know, move it along. We must get more arrests. Because he's thinking, you know, arrests will break the system. All, all the goody two-shoes uh, bourgeoisie house slaves, they're all saying, oh, arrest those nasty people sitting in the road, um, you know, to preserve the system and let the flow of traffic go. But there's, there's faulty going saying, you, know, you must move faster. You must arrest these people faster. And that's a bit of a shock to people that say, well, well, hang on a minute. Aren't arrests supposed to stop this? I mean, if we were arrested, we would stop straight away. Say, no, you don't, you don't get it. 
the more arrests that happen, the closer we are that the system is overthrown. So it's like saying, you know, like, you know, get them into the gas chambers. The faster they get them in, the quicker we can get this over. Well, that's a bit shocking for an inmate. So it's using the anti-hope kind of thing that you were talking about at the beginning. It's just destroying hope first as, as a basis for reverse psychology too. Well, it's being ultra realist. It's, yeah, it's yeah. basically confronting people with the truth. It's saying, okay, we accept all of this. So everybody's in denial. They, they're in climate denial, in collapse denial, in all different forms of denial. And you say, okay, I accept your denial. Then let's take it to its logical conclusion and ramp it up. Go for it. Well, that's the quickest way to bring them out of their denial, right? Yeah, I think, I can't remember if this is the right philosopher. He was a cynic, I think, from like Greek times, like Diogenes, be a cynic like Diogenes in the face of these things. Because that guy, I, that's the right guy, right? The cynic, the Diogenes, the dog. Um, yeah, I think that was the right one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he he pulled no punches with the truth. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's ultimate truth telling. It's the kind of truth telling where, you know, uh, a lot of these guys who make a, a name for the clever writing, like Darren and stuff. It's more truthy than they but dare be truthful. So it's like, okay, you want to play truth? Okay, let's double down on truth. And like, Whoa, said I was Mister Truth. I didn't say I was that truthful. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's really you know, take it to the take it to the limit. You want to go to the limit? Let's take it to the limit and quick. Yeah, if you go to the radical, you know, you know, limit of all these problems with the system, it's as ugly. You know, it's uglier than you can imagine. Like animal rights, human rights, the environment, psychology. Like it's all terrible. It's literally hell. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's saying like, uh, you know, let's, you want to go to hell, uh, we'll, we'll smooth the path, we'll, we'll give you the brochure. So you, you like this shit? All right, let's, let's, let's try and find ways to give it to you in, in abundance. So it achieves all aims. It basically, it, it gets people psychologically prepared to let go. It also lets people as I was saying in the beginning, is if they experience the stuff that they deny themselves, they are in a position to give it up, and they have to give it up anyway. The flipping is real. It's coming. So it's all a question of, of getting to a stage where, where you're ready for it. And the, the ultimate prepping strategy is to, to let go, to not be attached to stuff. So if you the way, the way to be ready for and prepared for uh, for the flipping psychologically is to is to really be doomed is to really be to as a dead person as ataraxia so as a, as a warrior determined to make it through if it's possible but already uh, fighting like a dead person for a doomed cause I think that that's the only the only realistic state of mind um to to actually go through what we what we're going to go through so if it applies any way you look at it because if if the flipping never comes and we just the the next step is is collapse so it's either internal collapse since since we won't have voluntarily vol voluntary de, um deindustrialization what's going to happen is an internal collapse of overshoot we're already in a vast overshoot we're already in drawdown of resources and so those resources are going to be drawn down we're, we're in a malthusian catastrophe so those resources are going to be drawn down to to collapse and uh and and mass dial so so we get to something like the flipping any way you go uh the, the you see the the flipping it's more useful to shove the, sh the flipping in people's faces because uh, it's hard to deny. If you look at the science of it, it's hard to deny. And there's nothing you can do about it. The problem with what the Greens are doing in terms of, uh, you know, in the environmental activism is they're trying to convince people of an argument that's very wishy-washy. It's very, you know, you, you say collapse, I say 
you know, we're going to have transhumanism, rapture of the nerds, AI is going to solve climate change, we're all going to be on Mars. So, yeah, your opinion and stuff as well. It, you can't nail it down. It's just, you know, your opinion against my opinion. Well, the flipping isn't subject to opinion. It's not well known. So people think, I've never heard of that before. So I say, yeah, well, it's been kept from you. But once you once you actually know about it and you go and look at it, you're going, oh, my fuck. You mean this is real? But yeah, it's real. <laughs> and it's basically, it's coming. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And that's that's the important thing is that there's nothing you can do to stop it. There's there's no arguments. You you can argue that the science is not good, but it's it's weak. It's uh, uh, the more you get into the science, the more you'll see that it's uh, it's it's real. So, and it's very definitive. You see, so the climate catastrophe or the the uh, social catastrophe, uh, industrial collapse. Is ambiguous. This well, it might be a band-aid. There might be geoengineering. Our way. We could engineer our way out of it. Is there's no way you can engineer your way out of the flipping. So it's a conversation stopper, and it stops there, it stops there, that line of thought. Is there anyone outside the extinctionati who are talking about the flipping? Of to your knowledge, is that something that has been? I don't know. Is there is there other people talking about that around the world? Yeah, in secret. It's a secret thing. It's not. It's not widely known. What I'm proposing now is that that you mean we, like in your book, uh, what you suggest in your book. Yeah. A number of people know, and in, in, in very strange places. That the places like um, the Scientologists. I'm not sure what they know, but the LDS, the Church of Latter Day Saints, and stuff. They they. Those guys have infiltrated all the government, and so they know all this stuff. But I, I don't know the extent of. I don't know a list of people that actually know and are working towards this. But you get strong hints. I mean, I think, um, I think the, the whole, the the whole. Uh, see, once you know that, know this, and then you can read things in in terms of this. Then, then you can see everywhere that people are. You know, acting very suspiciously. So, so in terms of the climate action and you know mitigation and stuff, it's the governments make no sense unless they they've already they already know that everything we're doing is futile. So coming out of COP twenty six, it's like you've got very few options. So you can actually say these guys are the stupidest people on the planet. Um, that's no one could be this short-sighted and and that stupid, and and uh, uh, so so it means that basically a sixteen-year-old in Sweden is more savvy than the movers and shakers in, of the world, and uh, who have access to all the information, talk to all the experts, have this vast fire hose of information being shot at them, have all the computing power to model all of these things, and you say those guys. Don't know what, don't know shit from, you know, they, they don't know apple butter from baby food. And so they, uh, or, and then a 17 year old in Sweden has got it all nailed down. How likely is that? So you say, like, you just go back, you can see it all unfold. So if you, if you just go back, go back to um, 1985 and Carl Sagan, go and see what. Maggie Thatcher's address to the United Nations, and see what happened after that. There was there was a pivot. There was a definite pivot. And you say, why did that happen? Well, you can see little drips and drabs of information uh, coming out. But the the guys knew early on that we were fucked. They they knew they knew in the early nineties um, that that we was irredeemably screwed. And ever since then, they've been doing panic management. They they've been prepping. They've been they've been prepping for the last thirty years in for stuff that people are only vaguely getting to becoming aware of now in the last two. So so you have to read everything that goes down in terms of guys that know that we're all fucked. Um, and so 
then you you start to see well you know you know Russia this from the Soviet Union figured this out right so so from from there you you can see well look at the Arctic look at what's happening in the Arctic initiative you get very clear indications that Russia sees a future in the Arctic and then you go and, go and have a look and you can see why okay so again talking you see okay so then that that's why it's worth getting a conversation going in a public conversation as much as possible about how to actually survive because you can start to read what they're doing so for example i just talked about how you've got to maybe three things you've got to survive the actual event then you have to survive volcanic winter for about maybe five years something maybe 10 my based on ocean circulation and very complex um, dynamics uh, it might be like 15 years of volcanic winter if you, but it's worth going back to Pleistocene and looking at the younger dryas and seeing the youngest dryas was a thousand years of cooling so it was uh, it might be a long period but for most of humanity's history we've lived in an ice age so um, but uh, you can assume like 15 degrees cooling something really bad uh, then you have a look you can they're, they're looking at all of this stuff they, they're looking at what places are survivable well i'll tell you i'm in one of them <laughs> uh you go and have a look they've done scenarios on you see they they a lot of this stuff they already had in their pocket because they they looked at volcanic winter see after they did a few tests in bikini and stuff they started to realize this you know about fallout you know about the lucky dragon uh, they started to realize uh, about the emp pulse in hawaii the lucky dragon was a fishing boat where they all got sick from the fallout from bikini that was the first time they, they knew about fallout they and um, then they gradually started to realize there's about volcanic winter so when they started to look at surviving the uh, world war three then it was you know you can go and look at threads and you can see how how they thought of it and that was pretty much the conventional military view threads is worth looking at because it is kind of what we're talking about oh are you talking the about movie the movie threads. movie threads yeah i've seen that movie it's a, yeah a english movie that was it was done on the bbc but it, it was considered so horrific at the time that the bbc refused to broadcast it yeah i re i saw that movie like a couple of years ago and one of the scenes that stuck out to me was when the government was in the bunker and one of the guys was like being mammalian brains and hey should we give people the food and then the other lady's like no we need that food to make them work <laughs> yeah that scene stuck yeah. out to me yeah so what what i've done over the years is is looked at all of those um disaster plans so the interesting thing is those the ones from the cold war are often public now um and i've seen other ones so i knew what was coming with this pandemic because i've seen the plan i've mentioned a number of times they they everybody has disaster plans in a in a filing cabinet somewhere so i mean at the level of the city at the level of your your county your state and the federal government so fema and all of them i had I've done because of stuff I mentioned. I've done stuff that allowed me to see the plans. They're all secret. They don't want the people to second guess them. But they, uh, I knew all this from. I think I mentioned this before. Is the first time I was alerted onto this this particular problem we're having now with the with the pandemic is. Uh, when I was in Zamat, so I was skiing in Zamat in Switzerland. It's one of them, like the premier resorts, but it was, it wasn't for decades. It was just just coming back, and uh, while I was I was there, and suddenly noticed there were a lot of graveyards in the churches, and they all had English names on. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell's up with this? And so I started asking around and I quickly got the impression nobody wanted to talk about it. There was some big embarrassment, which just fueled my interest. And I eventually found, you know, people that would talk about it. The story was, I think it was Scarlet Fever broke out. So it used to be the premier skiing resort for English people in the 60s. Uh, sometime in the late 60s, uh, I think it was Scarlet Fever broke out. 
scarlet fever is one of the things where they kick in with all these emergency management plans. And so um, the, what they did was they kept it kind of secret, but it, it caused such a blot on Zermatt that, uh, no, you know, it, it fell out of the running as a ski resort and took ages, decades before it came back in, into vogue again because it was such a stain on the, uh, that history was such a stain on them. But what, what happened was, if you go back and look at the story of Zermatt now, they say, well, they quarantine people and it's very, very vanilla. It's very whitewashed now. Uh, what, what, talking to the, some of the people there, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. From my understanding is, is they deployed the, the Swiss army around the a perimeter around Zermatt. So in other words, in all the mountains and stuff, all the passes. And uh, just kept everybody in there until the disease died out. So in other words, I think they gave them food parcels and stuff. But you kind of imagine you're an English tourist there. And, you know, you say, oh, I want to go home and stuff. And they said, take one step further and I'll shoot you. That was what they were. They were surrounded like that. And they say, like, go back to the village. We'll give you, you'll airdrop you some food. But you're staying here until you find out whether you can live or die with this disease. And that, that, and it was, you know, traumatic for the people. They were drove, died like flies, and um, and only when they were sure that it had basically burnt itself out, then they opened it up. And I thought, well, that's fucking interesting because I got to thinking, well, to actually deploy that, you you can't do that on a dime. And if you've been in the military and stuff, it takes a long time and planning to do operations. You can't just tell everybody, hey, get in a truck. <laughs> You're going to go and surround this place. It's like, it doesn't work that way. You've got to train and plan, and there's huge logistical problems, and you can't just innovate. It doesn't work that way. So I thought there must be all these plans in place for this kind of, and I thought, well, how deep does this go? Because, you know, it's just like Bill Gates keeps on reminding everybody since the year dot that we're heading, we've just been lucky so far that we haven't had any devastating global pandemic. And so, I thought, well, you know, Switzerland had, you know, is very prepared for all these disaster scenarios. The whole of the Swiss Alps is hollowed out. They can, they can, they can uh, harbor all the Swiss population inside the mountains in bunkers. I mean, it's Swiss cheese, the Alps. Uh, you can going around Switzerland, you can see the entrances to these places. But Switzerland is completely geared up for for war and for the cold. They those guys are pretty, you know, good bet for surviving. World War Three and the flipping and everything, they go, they're going to do the bunker mentality. They're going to hide in bunkers. Um, and they all the bunkers have like air filters and stuff so they can filter out some um, radioactive particles, which is something, by the way, if you're doing disaster planning for the flipping, is, you know, all the 410 to 450 active nuclear power stations, they're going to be all going Chernobyl. So they're not going to shut them down nicely and <laughs> they, they're going to be decaying like Chernobyl, they'll melt down. So they're going to be a lot of, uh, and that's another reason why you want to be accelerationist, is all these nutcases like Lovelock, they want to do a nuclear program. So and that's also slow. It'll, it takes 12 years or so to commission a nuclear power station with a lot of local resistance as well. But they're going to do all those, like, nu we, they're going to try and go nuclear. If you see anything like hydrogen economy on it, that's code for nuclear. And so they, they're going to try against the public will to try and roll out nuclear. It'll be slow, but you want to stop them because each new power station they commission is another Chernobyl that survivors or the flipping have to deal with. So, so you know, places like Switzerland will do pretty well because they, they underground and they can filter out the the radioactive particles. You need kind of HEPA filter kind of filtering to survive those if you don't into one of those things. But anyway, so I got uh, based on on that in Zaman, it's, it's very traumatic. You could see the people were traumatized by the state response to, <clears throat> to that outbreak in Zaman. So then I started looking. Uh, over the years, I got more and more interested. Whenever I got the chance and I ever got close to one of those the projects I worked on and stuff to look at these and they all have them and they're all horrendous i i told people before this pandemic that what what's going down and everybody so 
all the liberals and conservatives, normies and stuff, they, they all poo-poo. Oh, you know, they're going to chip you and stuff. Yeah, they're going to chip you. You're going to take that chip out of convenience. Because the, the way they do it is they, they start with the apps. They start with the apps on your phone and they start with a collar and then the electronic car. Eventually, you'll take the chip because they say, you know, it's the most convenient thing. It's more convenient for you because they'll have stories about people who didn't have their phone with them and then had a disaster happened. And even though they were, you know, had the green card and pass or whatever. And they, so, you know, it's, it will be sold to you. It's basically, it's like Klaus Schwab. It's like, you will take the chip and you will enjoy it for your convenience. So, but in all those scenarios, the, the reason why the right wing conspiracy theory has gone on that chip story is they knew there are a lot of national guardsmen and stuff that have been trained in advance to, to do things like chip people en masse. And the, the systems are there, the systems for monitoring them. So I, I met one normie who was like horrified at this, at this topic and said she was English and complete, you know, normie, bimbo, clueless. And so she said, well, why would anybody chip it? You could just ask for your papers. And it's like, you don't know what an these things are RFID tags, right? So already they they're looking at RFID tags in your clothes and the RFID tags in your number plate in the states, and the police can can interrogate an RFID tag with a gun from about a hundred meters. So what the RFID tag is for? If you set up a perimeter today, in a place um, like Zamat, that was really old school in Zamat. What what they do now is they put a drone perimeter. And if you know, if we'd interrogate your chip, and if you if your chip's not up to date, it would shoot on site. That's really where they want to be. Um, they have masses of sensors. That's pretty much the stuff that I worked on is mesh networks of sensors. So they drop sensors out of an aircraft, um, just just out of the back of an aircraft, just sprinkle them over the grounds, the mountains, and the terrain. All the, these little things are self-powered, tiny. You you would barely see them. They, they have masses of sensors in them, and they all make a mesh network. They all discover each other, make a mesh network that they can, that they, actually the, the civil response units and emergency response units can use those networks. They don't use the radio networks and that they can use those as a local uh, area mesh network in those kind of situations. But that's where they're moving towards. Um, and it's been in, on the plans for, for decades that they've had all these systems that they've been developing them and I've got seen glimpses of them. They're all horrendous. So the ones I've seen have been things like, if there's a pandemic, they, they will give you the choice. You either get the vax or you go into a quarantine camp. Um, so the the quarantine camp is is exactly what they're doing in Australia. It's basically the same thing as they're doing in Turkey is the, where the Syrians, they, they have a moat around them with the guard towers and barbed wire and these kind of missionaries. It's basically the same as the Japanese intern camp, internment camps in in World War II. So you basically turn Japanese in World War II in Canada and, and America, they had all these. So you, you if you go and see what it's like living there, it's like, yeah, you just... Um, have an internal camp they have you know mess halls and stuff like that and that's you won't be allowed out until you you take a chip and you take the, the vaccine the and so that uh um and so that's the kind of choice that that they give you in a, in a pandemic and so the only thing is that this one has been a mild one so so it hasn't been very deadly otherwise you would have seen that quickly all those plans would have kicked in the ones that are going on in australia they're not being invented now they're quite old plans that are being implemented. And I assume they're being implemented as a test run. In, uh, but the yeah, all these things have been in plan and people, people have known, especially on the right wing, because those guys serve in the military and get to see all of this stuff. All the left wing people can afford to say, oh, this is mad conspiracy theorists. And, you know, oh, you're conspiracy theorists. You're an anti-vaxxer on the right wing. <laughs> They're like, no, it's just, while, while you've been doing your social studies and avoiding the military, the guys in the military have seen all this stuff. So it's it's your worst nightmare. But <coughs> anyway, um, the whole <coughs> the whole point of all of these things is you you want to say 
uh, in terms of the extinction idea is saying, yeah, we need more of this. So this holds all of the system together. You see, the, the worst thing of all is, a, is a, another fish nor fowl thing, a kind of a lukewarm thing where, where we kind of land in this neutral place where we don't collapse fully and we don't, um, we don't have the, the accelerated melt of the ice sheet. So we just, we just slowly degrade the ecology um, uh, until, until we're flipping. That's the worst scenario of all. So anything other than that, that lukewarm scenario is better. So it's like, yeah, totalitarians are great. As long as they hold everything and keep the oil burning. Uh, if they take us to war, that's great. So you don't want a nuclear war. That would, that's pushing it too far. But a conventional war, exactly what's happening now is perfect. So that's why <coughs> this, by the way, is all laid out by all these guys who, who do this kind of planning and policy is like the Rockefeller Institute, go and have a look at their planning and go and have a look at lockstep. We're in lockstep. We're in their lockstep scenario. And so they they took us here deliberately. This is the way they want us to be. We, we They want us to be burning fossil fuel. They want us to be in a Cold War uh, with proxy wars all over the place. Um, and that's good. The, a proxy war, um, a conventional war without nuclear or limited nuclear exchange is great. It's great for the environment. It pushes up CO2 um, and accelerates the, the melt of the Greenland ice sheet. So you should, you should champion every, everything uh, that looks like we're heading towards um, the Cold War. And issue everything with like peace. Anything, anything is peace and prosperity and sounds like Biden is, is absolute anathema because it, it's too it's too slow. So you want to try and accelerate all of these things. <laughs> but so yeah, if uh, in terms of yeah, if if people are locked up and stuff like that and uh, the rest is the people uh, can go back to work burning fossil fuel that's good a, a really really bad scenario would be if um if everybody actually succeeded in having a revolution and then you had all these like revolutionary councils that implemented green policies and you know started to make some progress deindustrializing slowly because it would be too slow right yeah it wouldn't yeah yeah you know when i read that um you know that desert by anonymous right that essay when i read that i'm like wow this is hell this is like the worst thing ever like if that scenario played out where this uh system just slowly degraded the planet until like everything was dead I just like, oh, that put me into a pit of despair after I read that. And it was like, I mean, I already knew there was no revolution or, you know, no hope of getting out of this, you know, cage. But man, reading that and then the flippening is sort of like heaven <laughs> after reading that. <laughs> it is. It is heaven. You see, it's, it's a realistic challenge that you can focus on as an individual. So all of this thing about individual responsibility in terms of the planet is horse, horse feathers. Complete bullshit. You, you can't have any impact as an individual on the planet. You say, well, you know, oh, but, you know, the liberal thing is if we raise awareness and then everybody gets together and then we can do action. And so like, say so like, well, why? It's a collective uh, responsibility problem, collective act action problem. And you say, like, look, I, I've, I've often just to pro be provocative uh, and to challenge liberals have said over the years, you know, like, well, I can drive an SUV. I can burn as much fossil fuel as I like. It's not going to destroy the planet. They say, oh, yes, it will. If everybody drives it. I said, not everybody. I'm saying me. If I drive an SUV and I fly and do it, it's not going to make any difference to the planet. And they said, yeah, but if everybody thought that, what would be the result? I say, but everybody does. So I'd be a fool to think otherwise. So everybody does think that way. 
So it's like, oh, but we must change, educate people. Everything about liberals is educate, educate. It's like you can educate, raise awareness to it. It's the one thing that they can't get, their, uh, their tiny little minds is awareness, consensus doesn't change anything. This machine, yeah. even if everybody agrees that this machine is, is unreformable, dangerous, they're not going to stop burning fuel. It's like... It doesn't matter how many people believe you and, and are green, it doesn't keep the oil in the ground. That's what they can't believe is, no, we can do consensus action. Michael Mann, when we have human agency, we can all get together. It's like, who's this we, white man? There's no we. There's no we in, your, in, in this constellation. This, this whole we bullshit is, is bullshit. It's, it's left-wing bullshit. And the more they be, do this left-wing bullshit the more they isolate themselves and like the 50 percent so it's like there is no we and there's we disappears faster and faster the more you talk about what we can do in education the more the resistance against that yeah it's so like yeah you literally can't get rid of the fossil fuels like the fossil fuels are embedded in all of your food <laughs> there's no fucking way it's not about driving cars you're literally eating oil you're feeding off of oil you're a little dead dead try to see eating warm <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah, we, we all are <laughs> but it's also that whole concept of we that you're saying about that kind of global kind of you know awareness and and and, and getting together this is in total denial of what we as Extin extinctionati understand about about human connections and and the dumbbar number and what we can achieve as as little advanced whatever apes it's it's this presuming this type of thing about human civilization that has brought us here in the first place, you know, this kind of ridiculous way of reasoning. Yeah, and it's it, the thing is that they don't realize is uh, the industrial Prometheus is the unstoppable force and then the earth is in the immovable object. That's what's going on here. <laughs> Well, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and the left will refuses to to admit that, even though they can see it happening in every action. So you can see it happening with all the woke and the critical race theory, and now you get a backlash, and Biden's uh, approval ratings go through the floor. So it's like all the progress you make causes the resistance and the backlash that means you lose the next election. So it's just, you know, it's like it swings, this pendulum swings left and right, left and right, left and right. And so we, that, that will swing all the way to collapse because it holds us in stasis while we advance towards basically catastrophe. So it's, it's like it would be better. I've said often it would be better if the left or the right conceded to the other side than we carry on with, in opposition. But they won't. The, the left wouldn't give up its principles ever. They would rather die. And the, the right wouldn't give up its conservative, libertarian, um, religious uh, aspects. And, and the same with Islam and the, the Jews and Christians and stuff. They, they wouldn't go against their religious tenets, just like liberals wouldn't go against liberal humanism. So we're in deadlock. So, so you, you can't break that deadlock. So it, it can't be broken by trying to recruit people to your side, which is what they're trying to do. So for every recruit you get to, to your side, you'll, you'll make another one on the other side. And that's what the, the evidence is right there in front of your face, but they refuse to admit it. Or this dream that we all come to a consensus. We'll come to a consensus at the, at the gates of the, the ovens. That's when we'll come to consensus. We're like, oh, we're all fucked? Yep, we're all fucked. Okay, finally, consensus. We all agree we're fucked, and it's too late to do anything. And then, you know, you go all Mac McPherson about it and say, well, then we all agree we love each other. Well, I don't love you. I think it was you lefties that did this. <laughs> <laughs> and you fucking Christians on the right. You fucking did it. I hate both of you. And let that be my final word. All right, switch on the gas. But the, the, they, it's, I mean, it's, it's in Monty Python. The guys, are, the guys in the life of Brian. Always oh, look on the bride. And the so. guys are like bickering with each other. It's like, I say, yeah, Martha, I thought we had paid for an exclusive thing. It's like, not this hoi polloi. I thought we were going to be crucified in a more exclusive area. 
is all the way to the fucking gallows. This this is what it's gonna be. Yeah, and but that, the, that was funny though. In Life of Brian, they all start singing, "Always look on the bright side of life." <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the funny the funnier thing is these these are guys are on the fucking ropes. The, this is it. They're on the fucking crucifix, and they're still bickering and arguing and yeah. moaning about the petty <laughs> But, yep. <laughs> and they all, they're still divided. They still divided. They don't even unite on the in the final moment. And so, so yeah, this but we we designed not to. So there's there's nothing to lament. I mean, see it you see then the the uh, the left, the enlightenment humanists, they start to get a bit wrist slitty and start to go, oh you know, despair in the human race, and then they start hating humanity. I've seen it again and again. I've seen it recently. But that they go like they all these people that like all about humanity and the good of humanity and what we can all love each other and we can all get consensus and it's all dandelions and love and peace. And when they realize these people will never be dandelion love or peace things, then there's like fucking it. Then they hate them, then they execute them, then the hatred boils over. So all that sentimentality boils over t into hate so yeah you don't want to be on the wrong side of of an allison in the final days because she, out of spite and hate she will find a demon inside herself that is is uh is everything uh that that is monstrous and and she currently hates but and underneath all the sentimentality and the peace and love and that is is this uh, this this monster of anger and hatred? So you see it in in XR. They say you know they sign everything off with um, in love and rage. It's like that at the edge of extinction. Unlike what McPherson says, McPherson would love us all to die miserably in spite and then say yeah, ha, 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 see I was right. And it's kind of like like that too. In the end of the love and the rage and extinction rebellion is the rage will will chew up that that love that nobody in extinction rebellion with that attitude and the sentimentality and stuff like that is going to die in love they're going to die in rage and in rage yeah. against humans right and it, you see it time and again they hate humanity for what it is that that it's so irredeemable and it never would reform and stuff and they, they hate us all they will be the worst the worst in the, in the final days I've always but, been wary of people who use the word love all the time, love, yeah. because that is the, the telltale of, of something that's underneath that is extremely dangerous because it's a perversion. Anyway, using the word love, and we have that in our, we have that actually in our 12 uh, desiderata extinctionati thing. It's, it's, it's not something to do. It's not it's not a word that is nice to be pronounced and it's not appropriate and it's it, I, it's a telltale I know it I've been in those groups <laughs> I've seen I've seen what's underlying uh, the 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 use of that and you're right about Alison and the likes because uh, even though she's extremely I mean her analysis is are fantastic she's got a great power of investigating and all that but what's behind it is a, is something that is dark and i don't like it i don't like it at all yeah and uh with the sentimentality i feel it's really perverse and it's based on a delusion you gotta learn well i don't know if this is the right word but you gotta like learn to like love life and all of its visceral uncertainty without the sentimentality and i think i was kind of lucky in a way because i had a little bit of experience you know working with wolves up in the mountains at a sanctuary and Nearly all the storybooks I've read are not like zero sentimentality depictions of like, you know, animal characters living in the wild and living in, you know, unsentimental, uh, visceral ways, but still affirming, you know, the love of being alive and all that. And so I think that kind of helped grounded me, even though I mostly live in a city. And so I don't have a sentimental view, but I think life is amazing. Like it, it doesn't get any better than being alive. You're absolutely right about that, and I thank you very much for for um, uh, giving me the idea of reading Sirius. Do you know that book about that you mentioned a few months ago about that 
super dog. Yeah, because, I found that, and I I, I threw it up know, there for Hugh because of yeah. serious sensitivity. Yeah, I know, I know, and it's it's just explores that that um, that ambiguity between the wild and the and the and the human and that that sort of super dog that it's it's really a good a, a very good uh, introduction i I'm, i just wanted to tell you thank you for for for, for that book yes yeah, serious <laughs> yeah yeah but you can't say that you love humans if you don't uh, if you reject half of what humans are so we we're all a angels and demons we're all capable of cannibalism and cruelty and stuff and you can't say you know underneath humans are all good or something it's like no it's like that's not true i'll put people in situations where angels turn into demons and vice versa so it's like it's it's a bullshit narrative and it just means that you're a liar you don't actually love people because you you love half of what what we are yeah so, exactly so, like oh go ahead yeah it's, uh, so we went we went through all of this is basically it's cordelia and king lear and it's you know basically any any love that speaks its name is not really love so the fact that anybody that's gushing about love all the time is a liar you you know that they it's a cover and they're hiding something and they're hiding the fact that that there's a demon inside them that they hate so yeah well where i'm going with all of this is to say that the left and right dichotomy is uh, is not a bad thing it's not something we need correct humans are not broken this is, uh, uh, it's, we don't have to accept people for their faults and go all wishy-washy and sentimental. Uh, it's just, it's part of survival. If we weren't so dichotomous, we wouldn't be on the razor's edge. And you know, that's the key to survival. It's neither this nor that. So uh, if we weren't both angel and demon in the same embodiment, we, we wouldn't be here. So if you say put life first and say life is important, then say, well, you need that dichotomous human being. But the, you know, and that's what I say we do. We, we, we are for life and we are for team human. That means, you know, we're for the dark side too. <laughs> it really wants one-sided. There's this, this partiality, this one-sidedness. And say like no one who, who is vested in, in black or white what good or evil one side or the other left or right is going to make it through just not gonna you just you you are just not going to make it through the filter and and so and i'm saying that okay so that immediately means that personal responsibility and stuff is out is is like there's no personal action you can take um that that can make it all happy families and make it all a peaceful green existence where we can carry on to the future. In fact, you, you're a necromancer. You're actually courting the, our death in that certainty, predictability, that dry, predictable future that people like Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab want is, is our death. Is lying there. They really want the graveyard. They're, they're really anticipating the certainty of death and bringing it on early. So, yeah, from the Extension Arty point of view, is uh, personal responsibility is is acceleration. It's so like this is the guys are going to take us to the wire the sooner we we get to the field of Armageddon the better, um, because you know there'll be more left afterwards. So the sooner, the sooner we get to dodge and and have the showdown, the the less uh, the more chance there'll be that there's some ecology left. Um, uh, left afterwards for the for the survivors, so yeah, that's that's what I'm writing as much as I can. But in yeah. general, that's what I think. That's our pitch, you know. Yeah, that that's a good thing because, like, if you go ahead, you 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 muted. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so you all saw like that Sid Smith lecture from a long time ago, right? Where he talked about the primary productivity of the planet and like the weight distribution of the domestic animals, the humans, and then the wildlife, and there are the little green dots. I saw that and my stomach sank, like, because if you think of the flippening and genetic diversity and all that, like, it just ma makes you want to burst into tears. 
because you need genetic diversity in those populations and stuff. And it's just, yeah, holy shit. Yeah, it breaks your heart. Yeah, lack, lack of diversity. So so here's the, let, let's go back to those little internment camps. Um, and I think, so there is, this is the reason why you don't want to be in, in an internment camp like that. So, so there, there, it's fine while the system can support you. So if you're a Syrian and you're one of the, the millions in Erdogan's camps, um, Angela Merkel stepped down, leaving a genocide, leaving Germany's next genocide. Germany's next genocide, which has Angela Merkel's name in banner headlines on it, is happening right now. It's being set up in Turkey. I made a video about this. Is while the European Union, i.e. Germany and Angela Merkel struck this deal, while they're giving 400 euros a month for, for each one of those heads in Syrian refugees and others, basically Armenians and Kurds and uh, all the guys from Java and stuff, the, the, not for Java, the, um, uh, basically all of the guys that are Erdogan's enemies get put down as Syrian refugees so he can get an extra 400 uh, 400 euros from Angela Merkel. And so, so uh, here's the problem. Those guys are uh, in a shitty <clears throat> but domesticated environment <clears throat> in cages while that 400 comes. See, the problem is once this, once the state puts you in a cage, you at their mercy in terms of what what they can support so when they put you in the cage <clears throat> they cock of the hoop they have lots of resources they're powerful when they decline you're at the bottom of the list for feeding so the problem was is when the european union goes into collapse happening right now they at some stage they will get a wolfgang schobel or some bean counter that says we cannot afford to give 400 euros to Erdogan. He said, that's when the Syrians are in trouble. Because <clears throat> Erdogan can say, well, guys, <clears throat> I'm out of the privatized prison business. You guys can all go free. Have a nice life. He can't do that, can he? <clears throat> but he's stuck because he can't keep them incarcerated. He can't afford to. And that's the problem with all these internment camps. If they have a pandemic camp, all of them. You see, if we have a really bad pandemic and they put you in a quarantine camp, that's great. While everything is cool and the state is still rich and intact, if the pandemic brings the state down, you dog's meat. You, you, you're the, the last on the list to get fed. You, you are um, you're subhuman. You're a second-class citizen. You see, this is the problem with making vax passports and doing doing vax apartheid, is you're making second-class citizens. Now, all the liberals love it because they all believe in the system, and they all think the system's going to survive for another thousand years. We're not in the thousand-year Reich, liberals. This system is on the way down. So if you make second-class citizens, they will increasingly become the pariahs at the bottom of the heap. So you're making the next Jews that go into the death camps. You are manufacturing them, liberals, right now, with your, oh, you know, it's all a health crisis, and you people should be socially responsible, so you get what you deserve. It's like that attitude is what made the Jews into the Jews that got persecuted and gassed. So you're making the, the cannon fodder for the next genocide. And you say, well, no, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. Only if the state survives. If no, I'm not sure you I'm not sure it's only it's even worse than that because I don't think they realize that they are self manufacturing themselves into Jews because they are the ones who are taking the chips and the passes and the apps and everything. So the, the people who are outside the, the minority now in Europe anyway who are not uh, who are not jabbed or who are not you know registered are, are, are in a better place than they are in a way. In the in the longer in the longer term, because they're under the radar, they're not under the radar as much as the liberals. If you see what I mean. Yeah, well, well, it happened in in Hungary. You see, in in Hungary, they rounded up all the Jews. They did a, 
a thorough vacuuming of the Jews in Hungary, the, the Nazis. And the reason they did it was because the, the Hungarians made a mistake. They thought, the Hungarian Jews thought if they're good guys and they comply, then they'll be nice. And so they, they said, okay, they, they didn't come in and surround them all up. They, they couldn't have because there would have been local resistance. They would have, it doesn't work that way. They all do this thing softly, softly by creep. So they, they first said, you must all register with a, like a 2000, exactly what they're doing now. And they with the 2000, you know, rice mark fine or whatever. Um, and so, so everybody did. Because they said, like, well, we'll play along, we'll be good, we'll show them we're model citizens and we're good Jews. And so if we're good Jews, they can't do anything to us, exactly the way liberals think now. If you're good and you comply and you follow the rules, then you'll be okay. Only as long as the state is okay. You see, the big mistake that liberals are making is they think the state will always be there. We'll always be prosperous and you'll always be house slaves in your middle class little bourgeois life. I'm telling you, that is a certainty. The one, a few certainties we have in this is that that life, the life you have, the privilege you have, your place in the house, in the plantation, is going away. All you nice little liberals that have jobs and, you know, cozy little things in a social safety net and the welfare state, and guaranteed that's going away. And that's the calculation that you cannot, that, that, they refuse to make. They refuse to face the simple fact, the obvious fact, is that all that privilege is about to go away. So once you get your head around that impossible, impossible thought, which is actually the only thing we know for sure, is that that's going away. Is saying like, when that goes away, what happens? Well, they start to decide who gets fed and who gets supported in the death of the state. So if we're all on the state teeth, they start rationing who gets fed. And who gets fed is the people that support the state. So, so in other words, by saying that you're an anti-vaxxer and you're being interned in a quarantine camp, you've said, I'm against the system. That's a, a vote against the system. So you get fed last. And that's how people wind up in the gas chambers. It's, it's, while they still can extract something out of you, like labor, which they can't in a death camp, right? If everything is done over, you know, if all the manufacturing is uh, is done overseas, all the productivity uh, and material prosperity comes from sweatshops overseas, and then, you know, the machines do all the work in liberal democracies, is like, there's nothing for you to do. You, you can't make sacks anymore or like make number plates or something in um, you know, work on a chain gang in one of those quarantine uh, facilities. So, so you you are basically a drag on the system, and a bean counter is looking for ways to eliminate you from his spreadsheet. So it's like, you know, it's it's how his 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 strategies for eliminating you from the balance sheet. And, and you know, it's it's the bean counters who have to basically feed everybody and do the logistics. So you're a logistical problem. And he's looking for ways of you know, reducing your logistical burden on his, on his spreadsheet. He's, he's paid for how well he basically administers the, the spreadsheet. And so he's going to stack all the resources in, in uh, the compliant people, which is the military, because the military is the last. The military and the security forces, they always get fed to the, to the last because they're the ones that are saving the guys with the spreadsheet and so the 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 they get fed first the guys that's fed fed last are the people that are against the system now how it works is they'll find various ways to eliminate you from this from the system and they get worse and worse until the the solutions look more and more like gas chambers and so so that's that's the path we're on we we We'll probably pull out of it because the pandemic will just go endemic and we'll be over. But you've got a good look uh, into where we're headed without actually seeing it. So there's ample room to misinterpret what we've just been through. But I've just explained what we've been through. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a, the most important thing, the most important favor you can do to your liberal friends is to shake them out of this conviction that this system is secure and stable and, and will endure.
And so, yeah, the flipping is a great thing to say, like, argue your way out of this, asshole. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's where we're at. Anybody got any comments on that? I'm going to have to leave very soon. And as I'm recording, too, I might just tell us, maybe we could wrap up. I don't know oh, if you no, have no, any other questions. No, let's end it. Let's end it there. All right. Have you got time to just end it off and to just pause and end it? Yeah, of course. Okay, so let, let's end it there and uh, round it off. All right, let's pause. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for recording. Cheers, okay. everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good Bye. day.